You're listening to Past Imperfect, a history podcast brought to you by the Center for Wisdom and Leadership at SPJIMR. I'm Dinyar Patel. We think we know what India was like under Nehru. Socialism, secularism, a non-aligned foreign policy, and forms of high modernism demonstrated in projects like Chandigarh. But what if these ideas were mostly myths? Today, I speak with Taylor Sherman, author of Nehru's India, A History in Seven Myths. Sherman disassembles these straightforward notions and demonstrates that India's first 17 years of independence were far more complicated and far more contradictory. Socialist policies could widen socioeconomic disparities. Non-alignment, in quotation marks, had a decisively Western tilt. Sherman's book opens up an exciting new window about what we remember and what we choose to forget in the years just after India's tryst with destiny. Thank you, Taylor, for joining us today. Your book, uh, Nehru, A History in Seven Myths, relates to the idea of historical myths. And, you know, in India, at least, India is not the only country where historical myths were quite powerful in, in the mid 20th century. We can think of, say, the myth of Camelot in the United States or the myth of Gaulist France right after the Second World War. But what explains the particularly strong endurance and power of myths in the Nehruvian era in India? Well, um, thanks for that question. I think, first of all, I think we have to note worldwide, the period after 1945 is a period of mass democracy, the first ex extended experiment of mass democracy. So then it's not surprising that we get myths uh, in various countries. But what explains the myths about Nehru? I think there's a couple of factors, right? Um, some of them have to do with politics and some of them have to do with history. <laughs> so let me start with the historical myths. And I think uh, the biggest one for me as a historian biggest thing that stops us understanding Nehru in a complex way and having more subtle and intricate debates about his era is that there just aren't that many documents available about the Nehru years. So I was just at the National Archives of India, you know, a favorite place of mine to work, but also a very frustrating place to work. Um, in my first day, I requested 20 files and 19 of them were not available at all. And one of them this is for a new project, but the same, I would have had, had the same hit rate uh, on any post-colonial Indian project. For example, the Ministry of Agriculture, which is right next door to the National Archives in Delhi, there are no indexes for the Ministry of Agriculture after 1947. This is a huge and important in ministry in India, and they just don't have any indexes. And so if you haven't got indexes, you haven't got anything really, no way to access those files. And instead of comprehensive runs of really kind of boring bureaucratic files about what's happening uh, on a quotidian level, all you have for the Nehru years are autobiographies, biographies, and the selected works of Jawaharlal Nehru. And if that's all you have, then the first myth you have is, is about how important Nehru was. Well, of course, he's going to feel very important when all we have are his letters and speeches. Uh, if we had all those everyday workings of, of, of the government files about everyday workings of the government, we might be able to decenter Nehru a little bit. Um, I think the, th the second reason um, that Nehru, that there have evolved myths around Nehru uh, has to do with politics. And it has to do with the fact that um, Congress, the Congress party started creating the myth of Nehru, the indispensable architect of independent India, even before he had passed away. They tried to keep him from retiring by propagating this myth, by convincing Nehru himself that, that he was indispensable, even though he was, he was not convinced of it. Uh, and then after Nehru, we have a succession of unimpressive leaders or leaders who are um, not confident in their own abilities. And, and so they lean on their connections with Nehru, right? And actually, a surprising figure or set of figures in the evolution of myths about Nehru is actually the BJP, the opposition party. Uh, I, I argue that they're doing two things by propagating myths about Nehru. So first of all, they're building up Nehru in order to contrast him with Modi. They have a kind of system where one man is elevated far, far above any others. That was not the system that Nehru wanted. It was not the system he tried to develop in India. But the BJP really wants this kind of, um, this one man rule, as we, as we can see. Um, and so in order to sort of justify doing that with Modi, they elevate Nehru uh, to, to prove that this is nothing new or different. Um, but the other reason they do it is because they need an enemy. 
they, they need they need a nemesis. They need somebody who had as much power as they hope Modi can get, and yet is the opposite. Um, and I think uh, if he had if Nehru didn't have as much power as the BJP attributes to him, then he's not as interesting. He's not a good foil for Modi. And so there are these interesting factors that have to do with the way history is written, the way the Congress politics and the Congress party has developed, and then the way the opposition ha- has used Nehru that all contribute to the formulation of myths around this man. In many ways, that sounds quite similar to how a lot of Indian history has been painted, right? I mean, you, you, you prop up someone like an Aurangzeb or even recently an Akbar as kind, in kind of an opposition to, you know, particular Hindu opponents or ideas of what a strong leader was or an autocratic leader was. I mean, in many ways, it sounds like history is being repeated. Um, I mean, this is the problem with great man history, right? It's, it's not very interesting. Um, and it, it, you, when you have to shape everything... When you have to write your entire histories as if they were shaped by one man, it, then you're inevitably going to distort things because that's not how history works. Of course, of course. So in your book, you cover seven myths. You cover, first of all, Nehru as the architect of independent India, non-alignment, secularism, socialism, the strong state, successful democracy, and high modernism. Were there other contenders for inclusion in your book? Oh, good question. Um, I suppose the one myth I had intended to write... Um, and then didn't have space for was the myth that Indira ruined everything. Um, so it was not really a myth about Nehru himself, but an, another continuation of the Nehru myths. Um, I think there's a tendency to attribute all the evils, everything falling apart to Indira and her narcissism. And I think that, you know, if Nehru didn't build everything, then Indira didn't destroy it all. And nor is Modi personally destroying it all as much as he would like to, right? He requires a literal army of people to undermine Nehru's legacy. So one myth that I didn't get to write was, one chapter I didn't get to write was um, about Indira ruining it all. Uh, Another myth, I I think I could have written a book called um, Indian Socialism, A History in Seven Myths, because there's so much there, uh, so much fell under the broad umbrella of socialism, and there's so many things that I could have covered that I didn't. So the common timeline of of the Nehruvian era has been one of a founding moment of drafting and enacting the constitution, followed by a period of Nehru's supposed unchallenged authority after de- the death of Patel in 1950, and then a somewhat tragic, humiliating end with the uh, 1962 Indo-China War. How is this timeline itself a product of myth-making? Yes, well, I think the timeline itself has a lot to do with the lack of sources that are available after the inauguration of the Constitution, right? Uh, constitutional theorists and con- constitutional historians don't argue that the Constitution uh, set everything in stone. They argue it set things in train and that the Constitution had to be worked. The the, the provisions of the Constitution had to be tried, literally in court, to see if they held up, to see how they worked against the laws that were being passed. And so nobody who knows and works with the Constitution would suggest that it set things in stone and everything was virtually the same except for constitutional amendments. Um, And so I think part of it has to do with the fact that we don't have many sources after 1950. If we had more sources, people would stop going on and on about the Constitution and they would move away from the constituent assembly debates. But the debates themselves are really rich and amazing because they have all these cool voices that are actually not Nehru's voice, thank goodness. (laughs) Um, And so so they keep attracting scholars because there's not much else. Um, Let's see. Then the other end of that timeline has to do with the end of the or the India's humiliating defeat to China in 1962. And I think that it's true was hard on Nehru, but I would argue that Nehru had checked out or at least started to exercise a lot less direct control from about 1958. He handed over the presidency of the Congress Party to Indira. He was much more hands-off on uh, all sorts of domestic policies. I mean, he was generally, he generally delegated domestic policies, but he was, he took an even further um, step backwards after 1958. He was tired. (laughs) And, you know, 1962, the war, the argument is that the war broke Nehru, but I would argue that he was um, in a kind of, 
on his way towards retirement, an unofficial retirement before then. Um, and I think, the, so what we have to look for instead of these bookends of important events, mostly centered around Nehru. So after the constitution, Nehru becomes the, the first prime minister of India. Of course, he was prime minister before that, and then um, his death. Rather than looking at that, if you see, if you look instead at different policies, you see a lot of continuity, of course, from the 1930s, but all the way through to the late 1960s. I mean, take land reform, for example. They were still trying to redistribute lands in the 1960s. And agricultural reform, the reforms that eventually became known as the Green Revolution, they actually uh, had been inaugurated in the Nehru years. It wasn't like nothing happened between 1950 and 1967 when the when the improved seeds arrived. Uh, they, they were building on things that had evolved over the Nehru years. Uh, and so if you take it on a policy by policy basis, you'll see a lot of continuities that, that those timelines don't really work in any in any meaningful way. Yeah, the one thing I really like about your book is how you, you introduce new dates or new periods of time, which, which really perhaps should be of greater importance than, say, your, those seminal moments like 1950 or 1962 and such. You talk about, for example, I mean, just in regards to uh, Nero's kind of stepping back, right? You talk about how Nero, I believe, was, was trying to retire, right, around 1957, yeah. correct me yeah. if I'm wrong, but, yeah. but the Congress, Congress leadership. 58. But the Congress leadership, you know, kind of coaxed him to remain. And I think you you mentioned also how attempts to really kind of reform the administrative machinery of India began in 1952, a year that, you know, we might not really think about aside of maybe, you know, in relation to the first five-year plan and such. Yeah. I mean, I, the, I think the important thing to understand is that this was a very busy period. <laughs> There were a lot of people who had a lot of energy. They understood that India had a huge array of problems. They couldn't address them all through the constitution. They had to address them in part through legislation, in part through administrative initiatives, in part through state level initiatives. And so there's some really important reforms. For example, Panchayati Raj in its first version got started in October, 1959. Uh, and it was designed to revolutionize village level life. Um, and it really only got going after experimenting with different forms of election at the village level. It really only got going in the uh, 1963 and beyond. Uh, and so there's all sorts of different timelines. I wouldn't like to impose a different set of bookend dates, right? Rather, I'd, I'd like to say, suggest that we all move beyond great men and seminal dates. A, a, a good lesson for all of us. I agree. Um, so all of us who study Indian history, no matter how recent or how ancient find ourselves subject to contemporary political debate. And you were just talking, you know, a few minutes ago about uh, how the BGP, for example, has propped up Nehru in, in supposed contrast to, to Modi. Um, I wonder if you may have any particular thoughts on the somewhat unique importance of, of history in Indian politics, and in particular, the sharply divided opinions of Nehru that we've seen in the past decade. I mean, if, you know, we look at, say, American history, for example, we don't revere a Washington or a Lincoln in the same way that, you know, even a figure like Gandhi or Ambedkar is, or you look in even, say, British history, and it's possible to, you know, look at a Gladstone or a Disraeli and, you know, mock them uh, rather than just revere them. Why in India do we have these these kind of idols which we, we dare shatter? Mm. Well, I mean, I'm not a comparative political scientist, so I can't say that it's only India <laughs> that does this. But I think what has happened, a particular change that has occurred after Nehru died, is that there was a shift in Indian politics from focusing on the future to focusing on the past. And it's not that Indian politicians never focused on the past before. Obviously, Hindutva has a long history uh, and they were concerned with uh, the injustices as they saw it meted out upon uh, the Hindus uh, in, in various eras uh, of the past. And they had long been concerned with writing those supposed injustices. So that, that is actually a kind of through line uh, in Indian history over the past hundred years, that there is this group of people who are focused in their politics on the past. And in the Nehru years, you had Nehru constantly saying, let's not talk about the past. <laughs> let's think about the future, right? Because the past was full of divisions, even though historians will tell you that it is a matter of fact that it wasn't all division and it wasn't all um, violence and hatred at all times. <laughs> 
Nehru saw the tendency to focus on the past as fostering division in the present. And so he said, let's focus on the future. Let's focus on who we want to be, this kind of society we want to build. Uh, and let's focus on material gain. So let's focus on the roads <laughs> and, and feeding people. Uh, and so what has happened after Nehru, and particularly since uh, the 1980s, is you have the rise of a, of a political force that is in, much more interested in mobilizing the past for present political gains. Uh, and because the BJP is interested in that, they have propagated their own myths about Nehru, uh, but they have also forced the Congress onto the defensive about Nehru. So suddenly the Congress is talking about the past when they were never, that wasn't their thing, right? They were always the party of material gain for the present and, and a future India that was building itself. And I think in that sense, You've seen a similar shift over the past, um, well, 10 years in American politics as well, right? You now have the rise of Trump who wants to make America great again. That's a politics of the past. Uh, and you see similar changes elsewhere. Absolutely. I mean, you can see similar changes in Great Britain, mm -hmm. for example, right? With the debates about empire yeah. and such. So I'm going to ask you one question related to the past over here, uh, which is, uh, you know, the one, one, one thing that, you know, really strikes me in, in, in the book that you write is uh, you talk about how Nehru's India, or, well, I, sh I should rather say India in the period where Nehru was prime minister, but, but uh, in, uh, you know, in relation to the way you argue in your book, you, you say that um, emotion uh, was, was, was used as, as a force for social transformation. And you, you say the following in your conclusion, the conjuring of certain emotional connections and their use to inspire action amongst the population was central to the political programs of independent India. What, in, what uh, explains this reliance on emotion? And how could it be different from the way patriotic, patriotic emotion was deployed in other mid 20th century societies undergoing social and economic change? Mm -hmm. um, gosh, that's a hard question. Again, I feel like these are political science questions. Um, so I think what explains the reliance on emotion partly is that emotion, the conjuring of a certain kind of emotion, certain, certain forms of emotions, right? Not just any emotion, because a lot of times in the Nehru years, they contrasted their project for fostering an inclusive, a secular, a, de a democratic, a socialistic India with uh, a parochial, an emotional, a jizbati India, right? A vision for politics. And so they, but, but they, so they were fostering a very certain, a very specific kind of emotion, which had to do with neighborliness and nonviolence uh, and acceptance uh, and uh, a, a desire to work together to build a common India uh, and for the future. Why did they do that? Well, that worked for them in the national, in the, in the national movement, in the anti-colonial movement. Uh, and they found, I think, in part over the course of three democratic elections, uh, as much as Nehru lectured, and he did lecture Indians in very long election speeches about the merits of each of his political programs, whether it was non-alignment or, um, you know, this expansion of the steel industry, he, he lectured people, but what really got them were emotional appeals. And so beyond Nehru, you find more and more appeals to uh, a, a emotion in politics because, because it worked, right? Yeah, and I, I think you're absolutely correct in pointing out in the book that there was a certain type of post-colonial nationalism that had continuities with the, the colonial nationalism, which, of course, as you mentioned, harnessed a great deal of emotional um, uh, power, uh, you know, through its, its, its various programs and platforms. Uh, the next question I'll, I'll ask will be hopefully less political science -y in, in orientation. Uh, but, you know, whereas your book explodes some myths, it, it also demonstrates that some of our ideas about Nehru's India uh, do seem to have a, a factual basis, particularly what you describe as the era's confident internationalism. Um, how did a sense of internationalism pervade different aspects of the state uh, and society in the decades after independence? Right. So I think what's interesting about this question and, and about seeing India as an international actor in this point, in this period, is that it's often assumed that only Western powers could and did articulate a universalist vision of international order that was based on abstract principles, but actually suited their very material needs. But in fact, India had a vision for international order. It was based on abstract principles and it suited its material interest. 
And that, that vision included anti-racism or anti-racialism, as it was called at that point, including especially, so it's the starting point of that vision was that nations like India, who had previously been excluded from participating in building the international order, could participate. They had every right to not only you know, have one vote in the UN, but to shape the entire UN apparatus. And that's what India did thoroughly. They, they joined every single UN agency and put up very well-educated, articulate, and passionate people to lead those agencies and really shaped the United Nations in important ways, everything from, in everything from, um, you know, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights to the way peacekeeping um, was undertaken. And so, and that was part of an assertion, like Indians can do this just the way all of those former imperial powers, all those white powers could do. I think another part of its vision, of course, was anti-imperialism. It was emerging out of empire, um, but it, and it was arguing that other states had the right to self-determination. But this right of self-determination was not universal. Not every people had the right to self-government. And so self-determination came with the protection of minority rights. Now, that absolutely suited India's interests, yeah, because it needed minorities in Pakistan to be protected. It also wanted to have a kind of universalist backing for its own protection attempts to protect minorities in India, but also it had overseas Indians in South Africa, in Trinidad, in Fiji, that it needed protected. And so um, that that anti-imperialism, that self-determination, that, that protection for minorities, these are all grand principles, but they served India's material interests at the time. India was also very concerned with peace and uh, non-alignment was part of that project to, to, pro- to foster peace in a different way, a, a kind of dismissal of the idea that the Cold War security pacts were, were a genuine path to peace. Peace was, of course, in India's interests because <laughs> it needed peace to develop. Uh, and then it, when we think about uh, further aspects of Indian internationalism, I think one of the most interesting ones is that India was very attentive to people. So in people in so scholars in international relations tend to assume that people and populations don't really mean anything unless they're great men uh, moving, moving ships across the map in a, in a giant game of risk. But actually, uh, Indian foreign policy in its confident internationalism was deeply concerned with what Nehru called the human dimension of international politics. And that had positive aspects, meaning um, self-determination, the right to citizenship, um, but it also had neg- and, and positive aspects like security, securing people's loyalty by providing them with rights and protections, but also services like schools and hospitals. But also that attention to people also had negative aspects, including pinning people down, making them choose one nationality and not two, uh, securing their loyalty by making sure they didn't criticize India or, or the government um, of their home country. And so that attention to, to the human aspect on an international scale makes things for Indian diplomats very complicated because there's billions of people uh, and, they, and their interests don't always align with quote unquote state interests. But I think that's what makes Indian foreign policy in this period particularly um, fascinating. So the, the next question I have is, is in relation to, to foreign policy, but particularly the, the myth of non-alignment that you identified. And you have one very provocative line in your book, and uh, I, I quote, um, it is fair to say that India was rather a marginal player in the Cold War. The, the reverse is equally true, that the Cold War was relatively marginal in India's foreign policy, end quote. Can you elaborate and also tell us how myths of India and the Cold War have been shaped by the availability and unavailability, as you have pointed out previously, of particular archival collections. Sure. So let me start with the archives. Um, And I think, uh, okay, so quite a bit of the material from the Ministry for External Affairs has now been digitized and made available to scholars. Um, But even that is still in bits and pieces. You can't get really crucial. (laughs) I mean, forget about getting really crucial bits uh, of, of information. And so what historians have had to rely on are the public statements of politicians, especially Nehru. Well, no scholar of international relations would tell you that you can rely on public statements uh, to discern the true nature of 
of foreign policy. So yes, Nehru and all his diplomats all constantly asserted that India wanted to remain separate from the great power blocks. But you have to look beyond that. You have to look to material connections. And it, in, the, in the realm of material connect, connections, India is deeply embedded in the, uh, in the American world. Uh, so if we take something like fighter jets, India acquired 12 MiG fighter jets from the Soviet Union, and they arrived just before Nehru died. So at the very end of the Nehru years, India acquired those fighter jets. In the meantime, they had acquired more than 200 fighter jets from France, more than 200 from Britain, and about 55 from the US. So all of its military acquisitions across the whole, all of the Nehru years are all in the realm of the uh, they're they're in the in the West. In, I'll put that in quotes, right? In the capitalist block or tied to the capitalist block. So it's not so much that um, that the Cold War was utterly irrelevant to India. India was aligned with the West and was trying to use all those public statements about being non-aligned to conjure some kind of independence, um, some true independence for itself. If that makes sense. So th that's good to know also that the MEA files are at least somewhat there. Um, you know, I remember at least 10 years ago, we were just starting to get things like, you know, rehabilitation, yeah. uh, you know, and welfare documents coming into the National Archives. So at least there's been some some change. That's that's good. And I'm sure that will, of course, help us transform a lot of our, our views on not just foreign policy, but uh, many other aspects of, of history at this moment. Um, my next question is in regard to secularism. And you point to ways in which Muslims and Dalits were, uh, despite the law uh, and despite many pronouncements by people like Nehru, uh, subject to majoritarianism, sometimes very overt and very direct majoritarianism. Um, and, you know, you, you, you talk about in the book how secularism could oftentimes be performative and celebratory rather than actually concerned with the nitty gritty of profound social transformation. Yeah, okay. So here I think we ha have to be careful. Um, and, and I think it's important to acknowledge that, okay, so there were performative aspects of secularism. Uh, and the nationalists in, in charge of India after independence understood the power of performance to create culture. In, in some ways, they had gotten Clifford Geertz's um, understanding of culture long before he articulated it himself, right? That culture is public acts and the meanings attached to them. And so in the national movement, there were all these public rituals that the Congress party had asked the entire nation to take part in. And those public rituals helped create a nation. Uh, and okay, there were all sorts of fissures and it wasn't a perfect nation and there wasn't uh, harmony, obviously. But you had these same tools that Congress was still relying on after independence. So uh, participation in festivals, the preservation of the major monuments from most major religions, um, and the, the celebration of successful individuals. Uh, so Zakir Hussein, for example, or um, somebody like MF Hussein, um, or the Sarod player Ali Akbar Khan. So these were all celebrated as successful Muslims. And the, the kind of argument, if there was a public argument that was made, and it was made in several cases, was that look at these successful Muslims, therefore all Muslims in India are fine. Um, and so I think what happens is that um, all, all Muslims in India weren't fine. What we find is that... Um, Routes to pathways to citizenship for Muslims were much harder to, to navigate. That major Muslim sites may have been preserved, but smaller Muslim sites, including literally hundreds of mosques, were demolished and not repaired, not rebuilt, um, and that they were comprehensively excluded from government jobs. Now, does that mean that the rhetoric was, was a kind of Orwellian uh smoke and mirrors operation designed to cover up all this stuff? I don't think so. I think they understood that in order to create a, a society where everyone lived together, they had to they had to make people perform, you know, do these things together. And the easiest thing to do together is to celebrate a festival, <laughs> uh, to come together and take a public pledge, to, to go to school and um, all work for rehabilitation together. Where Indian secularism failed was that they were not able to 
transition to move those public declarations into the nitty gritty of negotiations, right? Of, of everyday negotiated life. Um, and so it wasn't so much, I, I, I don't think it was empty rhetoric. I don't think it was sheer, not sheer just sheer like eyewash, but they weren't because the everyday negotiations were so tricky and so complex and so local. Those big public statements about, yay, we're all Indian, didn't translate easily to local events. So, for example, um, after, say, there was violence between Hindus and Muslims in an area, what, is, what, is, what does secularism mean in that context? What is the secular state meant to do? They couldn't decide if the secular state was meant to punish um, the supposed perpetrators or was meant to arrest both Hindus and Muslims in equal numbers. Right, because that's what the that's what the Raj had done and called itself neutral, even if one community was really at fault. Uh, when it came to public servants, for example, what was the state supposed to do when it came to hiring public servants? Were they meant to hire people who 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 had no public who had no affiliation to any religion, or were they meant to hire people uh, in quotas according to the percentage of the population that they represented? There was no there were competing answers to these questions, both of which, or all of which, claimed to be secular. So um, it wasn't so much that the, the rhetoric was empty, but that it just, it, it, couldn't, it couldn't give ready answers to these, these everyday problems that government administrators faced. And in many ways, as, as you point out, uh, these debates are in reference to the longer history of what administrative structures or political uh, positions had been during the Raj, right? And in terms of, you know, the British, as you mentioned, trying to act as a neutral agent and, of course, not succeeding, um, but the particular precedents that they set influence uh, later debates. So the myth that is probably the mightiest that you tackle and assail is, is socialism. Uh, and you make a very important point about unintended consequences with regard to socialism, that the type of socialist policies implemented, uh, which were oftentimes self-help in nature, uh, tended to widen socioeconomic in inequalities. How did this transpire? And did policymakers eventually recognize the consequences of self-help socialism? Mm -hmm. Um, so, well, let me start by saying that I think when we talk about socialism more generally, when when we scholars or Indians in the 21st century speak about socialism, we have a really caricatured understanding of socialism, which be, is based almost entirely on the Soviet Union. Whereas, in fact, there were many different kinds of socialism in the middle of the 20th century, many of which relied on self-help. So I was at a Dutch museum years and years ago uh, looking at this, uh, sort of public housing for workers that was all based around self-help. And so self-help as a part of socialism isn't some sort of weird and uh, unusual Indian deviation. It was a, a certain way of doing socialism. So how did self-help socialism come about? Well, first of all, it came about from the fiscal context of the narrow years. And that context was the fact that um, India did not have enough money for anything. So Britain, of course, didn't pay back all that debt that it owed to India uh, after the Second World War. They scuttled out of it, and then they paid it back so slowly that it was eroded by um, inflation. Uh, and so there, every need, every wish, every plan, every program had to contend with the fact that there wasn't money for any of it. And whereas a socialism that was focused on state grand state expenditure might have been daunted by that fact or even deterred entirely. The Indian nationalists who took over the reins of government in the 1950s weren't daunted. Why? Because they had the experience of the anti-colonial movement where they had asked ordinary Indians to get together and do things, not just make public pledges and, and burn clothes, but to weave their own clothes. Right, and to make their own salt. And so they thought, let's translate this mass action into mass socialism. Um, and that meant everybody pitching in. Now, what's interesting about everybody pitching in is that everybody doesn't pitch in in the same way. And that's where you get the, the reification of hierarchy. So let's take a very specific example. So with the first plan uh, and with the start of the community projects or community development, they wanted Indians in every single village to determine what the village's needs were for development. They wanted them to get together in a village meeting and decide what the village needed. And inevitably, most of those villages decided that they needed a road or a well. Um, uh, 
Now, I think we could ask, how were those decisions made? Who, who made those decisions, right? I mean, I, we can imagine the communities and the genders that are excluded from that kind of decision making. But then if a village decided that they wanted a well, they would get help from the government in terms of the design of the well. An engineer would help them design the well. But then Indians themselves, the people in the village were meant to build that well. Well, who built the well? Let's think about who would donate the land for the well and who would donate the labor for the well. And there, right there, you have the reification of social hierarchies, that the wealthy donate the land uh, and, and the poor donate the labor. And who benefits from a well? Those who need their, the, so often the irrigation lines would run through the wealthy landowners' plots because, well, he had donated the land. So doesn't he deserve to have access to the irrigation? And then all those landless laborers or even people with small, small holdings might not have any access or very little access to that irrigation or even some access to irrigation doesn't have the multiplier effects that it would have with a larger plot. Right. Uh, and so it sounds great. Let's have everyone co uh, contribute. And the result ends up reifying um, social inequalities and economic inequalities. You note that um, it, on, on, the, on the topic of um, uh, democratic deficiencies, uh, you know, I, I'm going to turn now to the, the, the theme of successful democracy, um, that many Indian leaders uh, towards the end of the period that you cover uh, increasingly blamed uh, deficiencies that they were seeing. I mean, we're just talking about deficiencies in, in, in socialism, and I'm going to turn now to the political system. Uh, they blamed those deficiencies on the people. Um, I wonder if you may have any thoughts on how India's story of democratic disappointment uh, might be similar and different to those of many other post-colonial societies in, in Asia mm. and Africa. Again, <laughs> hard, hard uh, to act. Let me try to act. It's nice to have a conversation between um, disciplines. As I mean, I know you're not a comparative political scientist, but it's nice to try to, to come out of um, my own little comfortable um, historical cocoon. So... Okay, in Asia generally and um, North Africa, they all they try democracy in the 1950s, and lots of Asian countries decide democracy isn't for us. Now, is it the whole country? Did, did the whole country vote against democracy? No. But for example, in Indonesia, Sukarno started his policy of guided democracy in 1957, which severely restricted Indonesian democracy. Pakistan, of course, had its first coup in October 1958. Uh, it was in exactly the same year, same month that UNU in Burma called in the, the military to govern that country, which had been um, suffering from civil war. And the following year, Bandara Naike was assassinated in Sri Lanka. Uh, and the same is happening in sort of similar developments, uh, cynicism about democracy is developing across Egypt um, and Iran uh, and, and the Middle East, right? And so there is a lot of cynicism about democracy and India holds up really well, actually, <laughs> because they carry on, right? Um, in comparison, they hold up very well because they carry on. And so the biggest critic of India's democracy in the 1950s and 1960s is Jayaprakash Narayan. Um, and he writes to Nehru and before the second general election and says, no matter what the results of this election are, India's democracy will be a failure because he's very unhappy that Congress gets less than 50% of the vote and yet totally dominates the, the Lok Sabha. He feels he's worried about the activation of caste sentiments, about the fact that people aren't voting on the basis of sort of rational economic decisions, but uh, instead on, the, on some parochial affiliations. And Nehru, you know, to his credit. I don't usually, I like to, I like to deflect attention from Nehru, but Nehru responds by saying, you know what, I, this is not perfect, but it's what we have. And um, it's what we're working with. Uh, and so what they do try to do is deepen democracy in the late 1950s. And that's where the introduction of Panchayati Raj at the village level is it, it regarded as an essential experiment in democracy and development. And it only begins in the very twilight years uh, of the Nehru years. So the last myth that you tackle in your book is that of high modernism. Uh, the dams as India's new temples, uh, Le Corbusier's Chandigarh as a decisive rupture with the past, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
How does the idea of Nehruvian modernism cloak a much more complex process of experimentation, one where Indians, uh, rather than foreign experts, architects or planners, uh, really played the decisive yeah, role? So I think this myth about authoritarian high modernism owes a lot to James C. Scott, who is a fabulous scholar and whose work I have deeply enjoyed over the years. But um, so in his book, Seeing Like a State, he uses the term authoritarian high modernism to describe Le Le Corbusier's projects in Brasilia, in building the capital of Brazil. And that has been translated instantly to just about every project that it um, is undertaken in the Nehru years in India, whether it's building dams or um, building Chandigarh or even um, starting uh, uh, the National Museum, things like that. So I think one thing we have to accept is that although um, India relied on experts, it, it used their expertise for India's own advantage. And one of the things that it did is it would... Th- The cabinet would hold a meeting with an expert. So um, the Corbusier meets India's cabinet, I think, in the early part of 1952. Don't quote me on that. I'm sure the real date is in the book. Um, And they immediately tell him, we don't want your expertise. We want you to train our Indians as experts. And we can see this playing out across um, all sorts of modernist projects, whether it's dam building or architecture um, or art. And so what Le Corbusier does is he trains local architects in Chandigarh and they do not worship Le Corbusier because they're not encouraged to do so. They're encouraged to think for themselves and they develop their own ideas about what is appropriate for India in the 1950s. And that is equally true of the people who are in charge of the the Mudar Valley Corporation. They have their own ideas and different ideas about what a dam should do and how a dam might change uh, economics and society in in the region in which it's it's built. Uh, And I think what's particularly fascinating is to watch all these different Indians have a different take on what is modern. And it's not surprising at all. Of course, because we know if you put 10 Indians in a room, they have 12 opinions. And so why should that have been different amongst this highly educated class of English speaking elites uh, who were largely in charge of modernist projects in the 1950s? Of course, of course, they had multiple opinions and they made modernism their own rather than worshipping some Western imposition. Of course. Yeah. And I I think you see that reflected in many of the architectural debates playing out worldwide. I mean, you you mentioned Brasilia, similar capital building projects going on elsewhere, like in Pakistan and such, where, you know, you you have examples of how local traditions and local expertise were drawn from rather than, say, a a top down approach, uh, as is commonly, um, you know, covered in in, in literature. Um, In conclusion, I want to ask you uh, two questions, broader questions about the Nehruvian era, uh, both myth and fact. Uh, and what it can tell us about the longer history about independent India. Uh, the first is regards to the bureaucracy, and it come, it, it's, it's in relation to the, the myth of the strong state that you talk about. Uh, you know that the new ideas and values of the immediate post-independence years put pressure upon bureaucrats to ditch an attitude of neutrality, uh, an attitude of, which, of course, had been emphasized in the, in the ICS. Uh, and that increasingly, uh, bureaucrats found that the easiest path for them lay through alignment with uh, the preferences of the the ruling party, i.e. the Congress, at least in this period. How does the Nehruvian era fit into a much longer history of the politicization Mm. of the bureaucracy? So, I mean, if we if we ask about a longer history and we we push it back as well as forward, uh, of course, the Raj was a deeply politicized bureaucracy. Right. Um, These were people employed to work for the imperial power. And 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 uh, that was a obviously a political project. And so the politicization of the Nehru years was really to promote, worked to promote and give power to those who were most aligned with Congress programs and Congress values. And that was, it didn't pose a problem at all until Congress lost power. They first lost power in Kerala in 1957. And then the communists came in and said, well, we have a problem with this administration. It's aligned to the wrong political project. And they then promoted and gave power to administrators who were closer to the communist project. And suddenly you can see that a project that looked like it was just trying to make this 
sclerotic, bureaucratic machine that didn't really work for India, it was just trying to make it work better, was actually a project of politicization. I, uh, maybe unintentional politicization, or maybe just Congress never expected to lose power, and so didn't ever think about what the consequences of this politicization involved. Um, and so, but it's a long process, and it was very explicit. And so certainly when we think about the so-called politicization of the administration in the 80s and 90s, it's, it's certainly absolutely in line with trends from the 1950s that the incoming political party changes the civil service. Uh, and that is uh, common in some countries. Right. So in the U.S., you have the mass defection of uh, of uh, civil servants when the administration changes from a Democratic administration to a Republican or vice versa. They all go and camp out in think tanks and criticize the existing administration until the next election. And so it's not necessarily a, a dangerous thing for democracy, uh, but it ends up being interpreted as bad for India's democracy and not working to help the democracy. Of course, yeah, there, there, there are very strong similarities between, I think, what you see in, in countries like the United Kingdom or, or the United States in terms of this rotation uh, between bureaucrats uh, going in and out of power. Um, the last question is relate, related to what you brought up at the very beginning of, of uh, our conversation, the idea of Indira ruining everything. And, and that question is in regards to how myths of Nehru's India might pre-shadow myths of subsequent era. Mm. Yeah, so I think, first of all, I don't, I don't think India is unusual in propagating myths. I mean, what the business of historians is really to, to come along and say, you know, you've all been saying this about the 1990s. Well, I'm going to tell you, I've recently seen these documents that have just been released, well, I'm going to tell you it, the story was more complicated than you think it was, right? And so certainly I don't think Nero, in, in, I don't think Indira was a, a saint and she had a lot of problems and made a lot of um, poor political decisions. Uh, but the idea that she ruined everything is, is, as I say, attributes too much power to her, really. And but the one of the more interesting things that I've been exploring lately in a, in a piece of work that I was doing over the northern summer last year um, has to do with liberalization and the opening of the economy and I think there's this huge myth that has been exploded actually in tiny with tiny little bombs by but in small little journal articles that the crisis of the very early 90s changed everything and actually what you see is India was opening up its markets carefully in its own way, according to its own uh, political agenda from the early 1980s. It was, um, and then the IMF rescue package forced a few changes, but actually India was on that path already. And so I think there's plenty of scope for another historian to come along and go, you know, uh, all those changes inaugurated by Manmohan Singh as the finance minister, well, it was more complicated than that, and it started earlier than, than, than you expect. That's great. I mean, that, that's something I try to tell my students, and I'm sure you tell your students as well, that you can't really summarize history into these particular moments, and there's obviously much more complexity. Of course, it's a, it's a different question about how, uh, you know, how those, those, those new perspectives we try to bring to the table, how deep they penetrate into the, uh, the common discourse and, you know, of, of, of history. So, Taylor, I'd, I'd really like to thank you for joining us today. Um, Nehru's India is, is a wonderful book. It, it really gives us a lot of new perspective on uh, not just, uh, of course, Nehru the man, but of course, uh, the larger uh, trajectory that India takes, uh, you know, from, from the time of independence up until 1964 and, and gives us lots of think, things about also about uh, how India develops in the, in the years and decades thereafter. So thanks again mm, for joining thanks us. Thanks very much for the, for the conversation. I enjoyed the challenging questions. I feel like you asked me quite a few two-part questions and I only answered the first part, but that's, uh, that's life, isn't it? So thanks so much for reading and for that's the chat. That's perfectly fine. Yeah. You were listening to Past Imperfect a special podcast series by SPGIMR, brought to you by SPGIMR's Centre for Wisdom and Leadership, produced by Vinita Dvivedi.